And let me turn off editing so I get a little more room on my page here. Turn editing off. Where is my turn editing off? There it is. And now going back to that homework assignment for chapter 14. What you're being asked to do is create an Eclipse project and make sure to name your project with your last name in there. So when I pull it down from <coughs> GitHub, which you'll be providing it there, I see your name in it and I don't mix up your assignment with anyone else's. So give it the name with your last name in there, Chapter 14. And we're not going to worry about working on these problem exercises, though, but we'll start with the project by this name and we'll be adding to it. So I'm going to go back and start that project now in Eclipse. New project. Yep. We're oh yeah. Since we started with GUIs, we're gonna build. We're gonna build GUIs. So I'm gonna call this with my last name, Chapter 14 Exercises. First thing I'm gonna do to this in this exercise is I select it and I'm going to add a JFrame, a swing JFrame. And the name you give your frames and objects isn't a big deal. I, I like to call mine JFrame name. In Eclipse, if you go to your project settings, you can actually set your comments to be automatically <coughs> generated. But if they're not, be sure not to forget to put a header at the top describing your project. That's a requirement for all your code. So I'm going to go jump right to the design view of this. I'm going to bring this to my main view, double click on the tab, and go to design view. And before I even lay out any code, let's just get our size of this. I'm going to increase the size of this a little bit so it looks a little better on the screen. Uh, I called it JFrame main, but you can call it anything you like. I'm going to give it a title because this is my project. I'm going to just call it Manning Exercise or Chapter 14 Exercise. And just as some of you did in your GUI building, uh, it's great to do this with any project, is let's put a little label up there on the main screen Screen here. I'm going to do a component label. Oh, and I'm going to make it absolute layout just because I like absolute layout. Easier to deal with a project like this. And I'm going to put a label at the top. That's just going to say what this program is. So just like we do headers in the code, might as well put a little instruction on the GUI, and it's just going to say, this program demonstrates sorting algorithms. See Malik chapter 14, Java programming. Something like that. And I'm going to increase the font size of that, clicking on the font property, and choose a little larger font. It doesn't have to be huge. I just made a label, just a regular label. Labels are great uh, as you do different problems. You know, often the label on the button is, is enough to tell you what that thing does. But if there's output that you're generating, it doesn't hurt to put a little label under there, you know, showing re results output. See, see this, this area. And to test some code, easiest thing to do is just create a button that's that's going to be testing it. And this is I'm going to call this button. I'll call it uh, sorting practice. When I create the button, if I give it a text right now, calling it sorting practice. If I give it a name right when I create the button, it will automatically create a variable name to go with what I typed. If I ever come and change the text, it will change the display text on the button, but it won't change the variable name. So that's kind of convenient. If I want the variable to have a name like what's on the button, give it a name as soon as you see that selected text when you create it, 
and it will do that for you. But remember, you can always come back here and rename your variable in the properties portion. I'm going to increase my font size there because I like nice large fonts displayed in my... Right now it just said sorting algorithm. And about 24 point font, sorting, I call it sorting practice. So that's just the first one I'm going to start with. And as I work on the exercises, the different programming exercises, I'll probably have a button that says exercise one. That will demonstrate something when I click on that button. So an easy way to create code and test code, create a button to do the code when I click on it, and then I can have multiple things happening. Eventually, I'm going to be displaying some output, and I'll be creating a, a scrollable text area. But for now, uh, let's just start practicing the code. Double-click on this button will take me to the, uh, the code that will be the action listener. So, all, so far, nothing happening, just GUI. If I, if I play it, all it's going to do is short is show me buttons that don't do anything. Now I'm going to come back and add some code. All right. So, so far, it's just setting up a, a program that I'm planning to use then for all the Chapter 14 exercises. Now I double-click on the button to take me to the action handler. <clears throat> Under NetBeans, it used to give me a little uh, set of comments ready to go, like, you know, add your code here. Eclipse doesn't do that for us, but it takes us right to the spot. I'm going to put a little comment here. Uh, practice with arrays. Just because it's been a while since we've worked with arrays, let's create an array that goes with this chapter. We're going to be creating arrays, generating array data, and we'll be sorting it eventually. But first, let's just practice how in the world do we first create the, create an array. The easiest way, and I'm hoping this is a review, the easiest way to create an array, we're going to call it list, because that's what they use in the, in the book examples. And if it's an array of integers, remember how to create an array of integers? Yeah, the type, int, and two empty square brackets. says there's going to be an array of integers, and now I have to give the name of the variable that's going to be referencing this. So I'm going to use the name list. One reason I don't like list as a variable name, it's a very general term, kind of vague, and it's almost like that, that could be a keyword. So I'd rather say like my list or list of my data, but since they did that in the book, I'm, I'm using the name they had. So we're calling it list, and now if I, I could stop there, and I'd be okay, but I don't have any data in it. But I, So I want to initialize it with some data. And the, we call this statically initializing. Remember the left curly brace starts initialization of an array. And because I want to use the same values that they were using in the book in their little example, I'm going to go quick pop over the book page here, bring up my page in the book showing this list. And they have a list they start with right here with these elements in it. So we'll create an array just like this so they can, so it goes along with the pages in the book. So I'm going to put 16, 30, 24, 7 in this array. 16, comma, 30, comma, 24, comma, 7. And the rest of them are 62, 45, 5, 55. 62, 45, 5, and 55 generating our array that we're going to be sorting. Later on, we'll be generating our own random number of uh, arrays full of random numbers, uh, just to, again, give us practice filling arrays with items. But we'll start with this simple array statically defined for us. And before we do anything else, think about how we would sort this array. And in order to sort it, I could put the sorting code right here in my action performed method. But remember our, our good practice with coding. If you're doing algorithms that operate on data only, put them in a separate class. Things that deal mostly with the GUI, the user interface, you can keep them in the JFrame. But if it's something that might possibly be used somewhere else, like I'm going to be sorting arrays in my other applications, Make a separate class for those, because if it's a separate class, you can actually copy-paste it over to your other projects. 
and reuse your code. That's the goal of coding. Write good code that can be reused. So we're going to create a new class right now that will be dealing with sorting. And since we're dealing with sorting, let's just call the class sorting. So I'm going to make a new class now that will be dealing with sorting of multiple types of data. And mostly, mostly arrays. But we're eventually in the homework problems, they're going to be asking us to sort of vectors. So I'm going to call this class sorting, my sorting class. If you want to put your name in there, that's fine. But a generic name sorting is fine. And it creates an empty class sorting. So now let's think about how we might sort an array. Before we even looking at the selection sort that the book explains, I'm going to look at the first sort that I ever did. My first programming language was basic back in as a junior in high school. Got into the geek class of this little computer in the corner, little Altair S100 system. I don't think they even have S100 anymore. And boy, that we thought we were really cool using that computer. But I have an array, unless that needs to be sorted. So let's write a sorting array uh, or a sorting method, and let's make it a public method that does not return an array, it just takes an array and does something to it. So it's going to have a void return type, and we'll call it, since it's a sorting algorithm, I'm going to put the prefix sort, but the type of sort it's, that we're calling it is the bubble sort. The bubble sort is the probably the simplest sort ever, but super inefficient. So sort bubble, and it takes as a parameter an array of integers. So int square bracket, the type of the variable is, a, is an array, and we can reuse that same variable name and we'll call it list. Yeah. Oh, uh, if you do that, I've noticed that too. If you're, if you're, uh, what is the deal here? If you have the, if you have your project selected, and then you create the class at the point we have your project selected, I think it will automatically put the package in there. Yeah. So you can always, you could always put that line in there. I don't think it would break it, but. That's something that Eclipse does for you. So if you have it selected, then create the class. And I don't think we really care much about that package. I don't think it affects our code. But. So I'm calling this the sort bubble method. Question? Yeah. Since we're at the start, it's easy enough to just go back and remake it. And I think if you have that, if you don't have the package, there, I, don't, I don't know if Eclipse really cares. Comment that out. Oh, I guess it does generate an error. So it wants the package in there. Okay. So here's the bubble sort. Super simple. You hardly have to think about it. You think uh, the bubble sort basically is two nested for loop. And the way, the way it does it is for every element, I start with the first element. And I compare it to all the other elements in the list. And if, if the our element to the right is bigger or smaller than the one on the left, I swap their positions. I swap their values. So let's write that out in comments. For each element in my list, compare it to all the others on the right or with greater index to the right higher index. Remember that index is the location in my array of the elements. So compare my element to everything to the right of it. If the one on the right is larger, swap values. All right, so here comes the bubble sort. The classic bubble sort is just two nested for loops. So I have the four, the first for loop, 
for int i equals zero. I is less than the length of my list. Incrementing i each time through the loop. An iterative loop that goes through all elements. This is one of the reasons it's inefficient. It doesn't care whether it's been sorted whether, to check whether the array is sorted already. It just goes through every element of the array. And actually, I'm realizing I go to less than length minus one because I don't want to go to the very last one because there's nothing to the right of him. So I go to one less than the very last element. First to next to last. All right, and then inside of that loop, for all the elements to the right of it, I'll call this j for int j equals, well, if it's going to be to the right of i, it's going to be equal to i plus 1 this time through the loop. So the values of j start at just to the right of i. So, yeah, length minus 1. Yeah. And in the inner loop, I'm starting with j is 1 more than i. That means the element just to the right of the i element. And j does go to the end of the list, list.length. And then I increase j each time. One by one, as I go through my first element in my list, I now go through all the elements to the right of it. So I'll call this all elements to the right. Now here's where the comparison comes in. If list the element at position i is greater than the list element at position j, that means the one to my right is smaller, and I'm wanting the smallest to be to the left side. Then I need to swap the values. I'm just making this nicer to read here. I think if I format it, it actually may remove my spaces. I'm going to put a little comment here. Need to swap if larger on right. So if my list element i that I'm on is larger than the list element to the right of me, I need to swap positions or swap their values. So here is where this swapping and temporary variable comes in. I can't just say list i equals list j and then list j equals list i because I've already uh, put j into i. I need to put what's in i into a temporary location. So I do int temp equals list i. And now I can say, OK, now put into list i what's over there in list j. And now put, put into list j what I've saved into that temporary location. There is my bubble sort. My bubble sort is complete. Super inefficient. It automatically goes through all the elements in the list, no matter how, no matter whether my list is sorted already or not. It'll do the same number of operations. For every element, compare all the other elements, swap them if they're not if they're uh, equal. There is no and there and there's ways of course to make this more efficient. But for now, here is the brute force bubble sort. So at this point, we want to just make sure that it works. And then we'll go on to implement the selection sort discussed in the chapter. Now what I often do as I'm thinking through algorithms like this, I will draw the picture. And I'm just going to draw the picture with just a short array. Let's make a picture of an array of 3, 2, 1. And as I go through my list, I'm going to have for 
Well, i is going to take the values of 0, 1, 2. So let's, let's think of i as the values of 0, 1, and 2. Okay, the first time in the loop, i is going to be 0. All right, so element i, or we'll call this is my list. Yeah, so list 0 will be 3. So list bracket 0 is equal to 3. And so I'm going to be comparing as I go to my for loop, my outer for loop, i goes from 0 to less than uh, 2. i goes from 0 to 2. Now this right this way. i goes from 0 from up to 2. And now inside of there, for j equals, okay, it's going to go 1, uh oh, i doesn't go up to 2, i only goes up to 1. j goes from 1 to up to 2. And remember that outer loop doesn't go all the way. We're not comparing that to anything. Okay, so we compare 3 to 2. So we'll, maybe we'll just draw out our array as we, as, as we go through this loop. First time through, it's 3, 2, 1. Oh, we compare 3 to 2 and swap them around, right? So we get 2, 3, 1. And now we compare the 0 element to the first element, to the last element, because remember, i is at 0. And now we compare the, uh, the second to the first index, which is the second place to the third place. Yeah, we're, well, the first time through this outer loop, we're always comparing element 0 to 1, 2, and 3, to, to 1 and 2. So element 0, we compare to this one, we swap them around. We're still at element 0 the next time through the loop. We're comparing this element 0 to the next thing in that rest of the array. Because J goes from, this is J, J starts here, and now J is here. So now I'm comparing 2 to 1, and I swap them, so then it becomes... Why do we swap the 3 and 2? Because 3, because, oh sorry, because yeah, I, cause 3 was here, that's the 0 with element. But I thought we, we swap, so we can compare the 3 to the 1. No, but we're at index, it's the location we're comparing to. Okay. Remember, I is the location that we're always comparing. So we're always comparing the 0 with elements, the first element we compare to everything else, and we swap them. So we're always only swapping with this guy the first time through the loop. So that's why we call it a bubble sort. It, the smallest value bubbles up to the first place every time through the loop. So we haven't done anything with the 3 except we swapped it here. He's still sitting there. It's going to bubble down to be the last one. Yeah. So you can think of this as every time through the loop, I make sure... As I go through my list, I go through the first time, make sure this is the smallest thing, comparing it to everything else. All right? Now I've got the smallest thing here, which would be uh, 1. And I don't care how I did it to anything else. Right. Yeah. Then I say, okay, now let's put the next smallest thing here. And I search through, that's L I index 1. And I, it happens to actually have, by the time I'm done, I have the smallest thing here, but the 3 now is there. So the 3 slowly moves to the end, and the 2 finally comes up. And they put Okay, and, and we'll go through the next time. So that's that's the next time through the loop. The last time through the loop, I finally get 1 here, and I've been swapping them as I've been comparing. Now let's go through the loop again. We have a 1, 3, 2. But now i is equal to 2, or i is equal to 1, mm -hmm. the second element. So now I'm always comparing what's in this box to, to everything else to the right. So I compare, since I'm only going through this, the inner loop now, I compare 3 to 2. Oh, what, they're bigger? I swap them around, 2 to 3. And that outer loop only goes through once because I have a very short array. And now my array is sorted. So this is the result of a sorted array. But no matter whether or not my array was sorted at the start or not, 
I always go through all the elements on, of my array. So this loop always goes through one to uh, link minus one, right? So I have a link minus one. And this inner loop always goes through uh, the, the first element all the way up to the last element. So that's, all, that's link minus two. So this L, the bubble sort will always do link minus one times link minus two comparisons. No matter how sorted the list is already, it'll go, it has a fixed amount of time, very efficient, about the length of the list squared is how many times it's going through that loop. I've never had that phone before. I've been studying it almost three years. That I've never read. It should be important to. Yeah, one eleven. Yeah, one eleven. Yeah, one eleven. Wrong number. Just hung up. <laughs> Didn't even say sorry. So there's the bubble sort. Very efficient. Well, no, very inefficient, but very easy code. Two loops. When would you use a sort like this? It's so inefficient. Why would you use something like this? Like very small list. Like small yeah. List. Small list, test program. I don't want to worry about other sorts. I just want to get it sorted and deal with the data later. So small piece of code. We don't care how inefficient it is. It's a small enough list. So what it takes longer than, than it should. It's microseconds anyway, it's such a small list. And I've got super fast computer. So when I don't care about efficiency, I'm just processing the data. I'm worried more about accuracy of the data or how I collected the data. That takes a lot more time. Often with, with sensors, you're spending more time waiting for the sensor to report data than dealing with the data itself. And, so, and, your, and your coding skills are needed in making sure the data is captured accurately just at the right time. And timing is more important in getting the data. Processing is, is easy later on. So that's our sort bubble, but do we know that it works? Let's now write the testing code, okay? So we have an array back at our JFrame main. We made this little array. We need now to make sure this bubble sort actually works like we think it should. So we need to sort it. So I, I have I make sure I save my, have to make sure my uh, class is saved. And now I can sort it. So I can just say sorting dot, uh, oh, why isn't showing me a, a method available? I, yeah, it has to be a static method or, and let me try it. Now, since I know it's there, let's just type it. Let's do sort bubble. Well, we're going to let, we're going to, here's the deal. We can let Eclipse do the work for us. Watch this. If I, if I forgot that to make it static, I can do sort bubble and then give it the list. And I get a little red there. And I hover over it. It gives me the complaint. But look at that. It offers to change sort bubble static for me. Pretty nice, huh? I just click there. And it comes and does the work for me. So that's a nice thing. Letting Eclipse do the work for us sometimes will help, again, avoid little typos. And all it did was come and put the static in there so I didn't have to do it myself I can do that even having an empty function if I say sorting and I intend to use another function like this say I'm planning to write a selection sort later on I can do sorting dot sort selection that gives takes the list as a parameter and Eclipse comes and says wait a minute you don't have that defined yet how about I go do that for you okay it'll actually create the function template for me if I'm planning. And even, it looks like it puts a static void name of my function that I'm tending to use. So one way to use your IDE to help you code is you decide what I'm going to call that function, and you can even let Eclipse generate the template for that. But first of all, let's make sure that this bubble sort works. Then we'll come back and actually start writing the code for the sort selection. Now, how, would, how, would our, how are we going to see whether this worked? I've got the list. I want to sort it. 
there's a couple ways I could do this. Uh, here's the probably the quickest way before without even needing to write any GUI code. You just come over here to the sorting algorithm, put a breakpoint right here. Oh, it won't let me put a breakpoint right there. I guess I have to put a breakpoint. Let's see, where can I put a breakpoint? Uh, how about I put a breakpoint here? Oh, and maybe I'm just clicking the wrong place. Let's try that again. Double click. I will need to. I guess you. It would only let you. I can put a breakpoint there. Let's see if I can put a breakpoint at the end. Right click, toggle breakpoint, Control Shift B. It won't let me put one where there's not active code. So uh, maybe if I just did a semicolon, would that do it? Like a void piece of code? No, it won't let me do it on an empty line. So I can put a breakpoint here. Maybe, yeah. Did it let you put a breakpoint there? I guess I could put one here, but I'd rather put one here at the end. Let's just do this. Let's just do uh, just something silly like int a equals one. Yeah. Oh right, yeah. Let's try that. Let's try return statement. I like that better. Let's try return semicolon. Yeah, it'll let me put a breakpoint on return. So yeah, that's even simpler. It won't let you. It won't let me anyway put a breakpoint where there's not something happening in code. So you can't just put it on the ending bracket. So there's a way without even writing code, but we're, gonna, we're actually going to want to do that. But let's just see how we could debug this, because knowing how to use a debugger is very helpful. You did it? OK. So doing the return, it'll let me put a breakpoint there. Now I can run debug. Remember, it won't execute my code until I click that button because I, that, the, the button handler was there. And now sorting practice should fire me up. The debugger, it does come, ask me how do I want to, it does change my perspective a little bit. And I'll say, yes, go ahead. And now it puts me at the line right there where it's getting ready to return. And I can just hover over the variable list and click the plus on there. Hover over the variable. I thought, there, I can see the elements in there as I hover over it. And there I see the values indeed have been sorted in my list. I just, when it's, when I'm at the breakpoint, I just come and hover over my variable name and it shows me the elements in there. Yeah, I did a run. I click, I gotta click on the little bug to run it. If you do the regular run, it's not debugging it. You have to do the, the debug run. Yeah, I did a quick click on that. And notice, if I hover over other, other variables, this temp variable, it doesn't show me anything in temp because temp was only defined in this scope. In my statement here at the return statement where I'm debugging, temp has been thrown away by the time I get out to here. So if I actually want to see what's in temp, I have to put a breakpoint inside this loop because the scope of temp is only for this location. So right now, since the only variable that's defined outside the scope of these for loops is, is the list, I don't even know what the value of i is because i has, was defined during the for loop and i is no longer uh, alive. Its, its scope is gone. But the list variable, if I hover any mention of list there or any time in the code, if I hover over it, it shows me its contents. So even without having to write the little, you know, generate the list of code, I can, I can see what's uh, in that list variable. But we want to do it without needing the debugger. So here's the next way. Back to my JFrame, and in the design of my JFrame, my main JFrame, I'm going to double click now. I want to have a place where I can display results for multiple uh, tests as I write this program. And because I want to put it in a text area that might have more text than will fit in the little rectangle, I want it to be able to scroll. So what I need to do is have a container that will scroll. So I come up here to containers. And I'm going to put a a J scroll pane. 
J scroll pane, and I'm going to put it over here somewhere on the right. And as I do different testings of different algorithms, I'll be displaying results over there in a pane that may be scrolling for me. So I make a scroll pane, and then I add to that scroll pane a text, a J text area. So J scroll pane, draw it however large you want it, and then grab, select a text area, and then come over there and, and add it to the viewport of the J scroll pane. I don't want to put it to the row or column header. I want to just put it in the viewport, a text area. And at this point, again, I can give the variable name. I'm going to call it txt results. When, once I give it the name there, the actual variable name will be called txt r txt results. Now, if I don't like that name, I can come back there and change it. But it, it likes to put txt r in front of it. Uh, I'm not sure why that txt r. And now the only thing I'm going to do in the last minute I have left here is in my button, I want to display those results. Well, notice over here I named it. I created it after I created my button. I want to move that button down to the bottom so it can refer to that text area. Let's see if I can move the button down to the bottom. And now let's see my code to see if, yeah, see now my, bot, my button is at the bottom. It can now refer to the txtr text results. So now that I've sorted my list right here, I can now do uh, display results. And I can do a little for loop for, I'll do my favorite variable, int i equals zero i is less than list.length i++ plus plus. I can say txtr txt results dot append I can append a line or a string to that text area and I'm going to append the value of the that position in the array. I'm going to append int, sorry, not int, list bracket i, and I'm going to add a space, a comma, and a space after that. So all the values in my array will be listed separated by commas in that results area. And all it's going to do is prove that my list was sorted. I can stop. It's been running a debug. I can terminate the debug version. Now run this without debugging. And as I click sorting practice, it should show my new results up there in that text box. And as I run it again, it'll oh, I need to put a I need to put an end of line there, all otherwise it's putting them all on one line. But I can see my array, my list got sorted. And it automatically adds scroll bars if things go beyond the length of the row or too many lines. So there we have a way of, of displaying results. And just to get it on a new line, I'm going to go txt r txt results dot append. I'm going to append a new line, which is backslash n. Just so it doesn't keep following them onto one, one line. And that's just a demonstration of building the GUI and running the bubble sort. We'll run it one last time. It has a statically defined list. It sorts it, displays the results on the on the my little GUI. And now we'll be adding more to that next time. We'll then work on the selection sort. Figure I'd start with something simpler than selection sort, very inefficient. And the selection sort isn't a whole lot more efficient. We'll think about ways to actually make that 
speed up a little bit, but it is time to end. Have a great day. Read through chapter 14. I'm hoping it will be easy reading because it's covering a raise that we have covered before, but good review working with the race.